is David Wayburn, and I will be presenting a short PowerPoint slide movie on the paper I wrote concerning the scaling of the turbulent velocity profile using the Prano Plus parameter. Prano Plus parameters are considered universal, applying to all turbulent exterior and interior flows along a wall. In this video, I will review the simple faulkner scan analysis I used on the paper that shows that the Prano Plus parameters only work for sink flows and not general faulkner scan flows, at least theoretically. Experimentally generated faulkner scan flows are pretty common in the literature. They represent an important subset of wind tunnel experiments. In the same paper I reported the failure, I proposed a remedy that involves defining a new set of scaling parameters that essentially reverse engineers the Prandtl plus failure. The new parameters not only eliminates the Prandtl theoretical problem, but behaves almost identical on experimental data sets. So let's get started. Hello, thanks for tuning in. The research I will be presenting is based on a PDF file listed here, which is available from archive.org. I have included a link in the comments section below. So, let's set the scene. A fluid flowing from left to right encounters a thin flat plate. The plate in the flow extends in and out of the plane in the plus minus z direction. A boundary layer develops along the plate in the flow direction, such that the velocity is zero at the surface, and gradually transitions to u sub e at the boundary layer edge. When we refer to the velocity profile along the plate, we mean the velocity u at x for all y. At some point along the plate, the flow transitions from laminar to turbulent flow. As the flow develops, the boundary layer thickness continues to grow. The question we are interested in is whether there are scaling parameters that make the turbulent profiles at different stations along the plate appear to be similar. The turbulent boundary layer appears to be special in that the velocity profiles have two distinct regions. An inner region where viscosity is important and an outer region where it is not. This is not obvious from looking at the velocity profiles. Here are a series of velocity profiles from DeGraff and Eaton at Stanford University. From the momentum balance equation, we know the viscosity will be important where the second derivative of the velocity is significant. If we take the second derivative numerically, what we see is that the near wall region is four or five orders of magnitude greater than in the outer region. The second derivative times the kinematic viscosity gives the viscous momentum contribution in the momentum balance equation. From this, we see that the near wall inner region is dominated by viscosity and that viscosity is basically absent in the outer region. So the question is what are the scaling parameters that work for the inner region? What we want to know is whether there are scaling parameters that make the scaled velocity profile inner region at x sub 3 look similar to the scaled velocity profile inner region at x sub 4. Two velocity profiles are said to be similar if they differ only by the scaling parameters in y and u at xy. Let's take the length scale as delta sub s and the velocity scale as u sub s. Mathematically, the definition of similarity is written as this equation. So the question is, what are the scaling parameters for the inner region? It has been universally accepted that the Prandtl plus parameters are the proper scaling for the turbulent boundary layer inner region. The Prandtl velocity scale is given by the friction velocity u sub tau, and the length scaling parameter is the kinematic viscosity divided by the friction velocity. Before we continue, notice that the Prandtl approach is based on the one parameter that is experimentally accessible, and that is the wall shear stress. Prandtl converted this velocity derivative into a length and velocity scale. The one reason why the Prandtl scaling parameters have been considered universal is apparently they work so well. Here is the same data we looked at from DeGraff and Eaton, but now using a log scale to spread the profiles out a little bit more. Notice how the Prandtl plus scaling collapses the inner region to a single curve. This is an indication of similarity. 
if the Prandtl plus scaling parameters work so well, what is the problem? Well, first of all, the friction velocity is almost always determined using the Clauser chart method, which assumes the logarithmic law of the wall holds. The log law, in turn, assumes that the Prandtl plus scaling parameters hold, thus a circular logic problem. By extracting the friction velocity by essentially fitting the profile to a logarithmic function and then using that fitted friction value to scale the profile, it is no wonder that all the inner region curves collapse to a single curve. If they don't collapse to a single curve, you have done something wrong. Now, you would think that some group would have verified the Clauser method for obtaining the friction velocity by comparing to some other independent determination of the friction velocity. But as far as I can tell, this has never been done. Secondly, there is no theoretical proof that the Prandtl plus scaling parameters must be correct. No one has offered a theoretical proof that the Prandtl plus parameters must scale the inner region of a turbulent boundary layer. There has been no proof to date, so let's see what we can do. The traditional theoretical approach to similarity begins with the flow governing equations, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Using a string function approach, we can reduce the partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations. So we start by defining our stream function in terms of our length and velocity scale times a dimensionless f function which is only dependent on the stretched y value. The stream function based velocities are then introduced into the faulkner scan x momentum equation shown here. What we end up with is this dimensionless form. Now, these x-dependent terms must change proportionately as we move from station to station. Otherwise, the solution will depend on x. If we divide through by one of the x-based terms, we end up with a bunch of what should be constants. The alpha and beta terms shown here are two of the resulting terms. We will also have terms based on the Rhinel stress terms, but these additional terms do not change the fact that alpha and beta must be constant for similarity. These alpha and beta terms are the so-called faulkner scan similarity constants. What we end up with is the turbulent boundary layer version of the faulkner scan equation. So let's do the obvious and apply the Prandtl plus scaling to the alpha and beta terms. What we end up with is the terms given here. Similarity requires that alpha and beta must be constants. If beta is a constant, then the differential equation has a solution that is proportional to 1 over x. Similarity also requires that u sub e divided by u sub tau must be constant. This means that u sub e also must behave as 1 over x. This type of flow is called sink flow. Wait a minute, sink flow? I thought the Prandtl plus scaling was universally applicable to all turbulent boundary layers. What about other m value flows? What about turbulent zero pressure gradient flow, m equals zero? What about turbulent stagnant point flow, m equals one? Usually one associates Faulkner scan with laminar whole profile flows, but there is nothing in the theory that prevents us applying it to the inner region of the turbulent boundary layer. Prandtl plus scaling does not properly scale the inner region of the turbulent boundary layer for general faulkner scan flows. It fails. They are not the scaling parameters that make alpha and beta constant for anything except m equal minus 1. So instead of proving theoretically that it works, we just showed that it doesn't work for general faulkner scan turbulent flows. So, how do we fix this? What's the remedy? Well, the fix is pretty straightforward. We essentially reverse engineer the failure and define a new set of scaling parameters such that the ratio is proportional to wall shear stress. Now, this step may seem a little mysterious, but I have shown theoretically that this must be the case. See the paper described below. Defining the ratio is not enough, though. To flesh out the definition, we require that the alpha and beta be constants. With those definitions, we end up with u sub 0 and delta sub 0 defined in terms of the friction velocity, just as was done by the Prandtl plus scaling. So instead of just being the friction velocity and 1 over the friction velocity, it's a little more complicated. We end up with these simple differential equations for u sub 0 and delta sub 0 shown here. 
Let's try this new parameter set and see if it works on experimental data sets. Here are seven profiles plotted with the two different parameter sets. As you can see, the results look very similar. I went through a few other experimental data sets in the paper, and the other experimental results also look similar. More testing needs to be done, but finding data sets where the wall shear stress is determined without using the logarithmic law of the wall is very difficult. This needs to be emphasized. The wall shear stress is most often obtained by assuming the logarithmic law of the wall holds, in which case the near wall velocity profile scaled with the parameter plus parameters will always look good. This is because what is done is to fix kappa and c and then fit the logarithmic function with the wall shear stress as the only unknown. This ensures the profiles will overlap in the near wall region. However, given the Prano plus failure means that the logarithmic law of the wall fails for general faulkner scon flows. This method for obtaining the wall shear stress is at best a good approximation. An important detail about the experimental results is that the Prano plus failure we just discussed appears to be only theoretical in that experimentally plus scaling appear to work for general faulkner scon flows. The Skari and Krogstad results we just looked at is an example. This is important because most wind tunnel experiments involving flow over plates are analyzed as faulkner scon flows, which means this type of flow is very common in the literature. So how is it that the Prano Plus parameters have been so successful to date? Could it be that the Prano Plus parameters derived from the log law just are good approximations to the delta zero and u zero parameters. It is easy to show that experimental plots of turbulent boundary layer velocity profiles will appear identical for the two parameter sets if the rota similarity constraint u sub tau divided by u sub e equal constant holds. It all comes back to the fact that both parameter sets are based on the wall shear stress the one experimental parameter that can be directly linked to the wall fluid interaction. Prandtl developed one way to convert the velocity derivative at the wall into a length and velocity scaling parameter. It is not the only way. The new delta zero and u zero parameters are a different way that does not suffer from the Prandtl's theoretical problem. The work we just reviewed describes the x behavior of the u zero and delta zero but not the identity of these two parameters. In the follow-on paper listed here, the identity of these parameters is revealed. The advantages of the new parameters compared to the Prandtl parameters are discussed in detail. One of the advantages of the new parameters is that it is possible to prove the new set must be similarity scaling parameters for the turbulent boundary layer. A second advantage of the new parameters is that they can be directly connected to the physics of the boundary layer. Okay, that's it. Thanks for tuning in. The results are presented in an archive.org paper listed here. I am also working on a follow-on video based on the follow-on paper listed here. I would really like to hear any comments or suggestions, so please send them in to the email listed below. Thanks again. Goodbye.